I'm author and athlete Brad Kearns. Welcome to the Be Rad Podcast, where we explore ways to pursue peak performance with passion throughout life. Visit bradkearns.com for great resources on healthy eating, exercise, and lifestyle. And here we go with the show. Raise your hand and reference the number of times that you have eaten too many steaks or too many omelets or uh, too many eggs like Cool Ham Luke in the movie. Not really that relevant because uh, after you eat a significant high-protein meal, you're not going to be wandering around an hour later looking for more, (laughs) another cut of salmon after you had a, a wonderful dinner. That's how the ketone production uh, got wired into our genetics. It was a key survival mechanism throughout evolution to allow us to continue to go hard and to fuel that incredibly ravenous brain wanting 20% of all our daily calories despite only weighing 2% of your total body weight. I don't want to live to be 170 years old if I'm walking around hunched over and, um, you know, I I don't have any libido, I don't have any energy, but I'm just uh, drifting along through life because uh, his calories are restricted or he's engaging in whatever magic formula there is. Okay, let's call this dialing in your eating and exercise patterns for fat reduction for peak performance with particular reflections and expert insights on this ongoing theme of energy balance and calling into question some of the foundational principles of fasting, low-carb, keto, and other restrictive diets. Uh, We've talked so much about this, and I really want to do a show here to give you some marching orders and get you focused, but also hearing from uh, a number of respected voices in the progressive health community so we can help sort through uh, some of these insights and perhaps work through some of the confusion uh, when we're talking about uh, calling into question these things that have long been assumed, like fasting is so wonderful, your body works best in a fasted state, all these things are highly valid, all the wonderful benefits of the ketogenic diet and the amazing health transformations people have had uh, pursuing restrictive diets and healing from things like leaky gut. But zooming back out for a bit uh, to look at that big picture, especially for a healthy, fit, active person who harbors competitive goals, fitness goals, and those longevity goals that come from being a fit specimen with functional muscle mass and cardiovascular conditioning and all that. So in part one, we talked about why restrictive diets are effective, and it's largely because of their restrictiveness, restricting you from a free and undisciplined access to uh, all manner of food all the time. Uh, but mainly, the restrictive diets work because of what they eliminate, rather than the magical powers of engaging in uh, a plant-based eating pattern, or a carnivore eating pattern, or a ketogenic eating pattern. So when you kind of get focused in, uh, build some momentum, some motivation, and decide to embark upon a restrictive diet, you are by definition eliminating these uh, very harmful, uh, hyperpalatable, heavily processed foods that hamper internal energy production or energy burning. And when you are uh, dosing yourself with toxins, chemicals, things that harm the gut, things that promote inflammation, autoimmune, and uh, oxidation and inflammation in the body. Uh, You become a poor energy burning machine and therefore default to consumption of more processed foods that give you that quick burst of energy, uh, but then eventually um, you you get into a fat storage pattern. We've often called this the uh, carbohydrate insulin model of obesity, and now it's widely regarded as uh, a big bigger picture than that, especially with the refined industrial seed oils playing uh, center stage being the most offensive thing to eat when it comes to hampering your ability to burn uh, stored energy and generate cellular energy. Okay, so the big takeaway uh, from, from that last episode was to get healthy first before you contemplate fat reduction goals. And that is primarily uh, initiated by uh, getting rid of the processed foods, the refined industrial seed oils and the refined carbohydrates, uh, sugars and grains. And then that new category that's uh, of great attention for uh, many sensitive people is to try an elimination period of the natural plant toxins, including the foods that are widely regarded to be the health centerpieces of the modern diet. Uh, So the categories that uh, Dr. Paul Saladino promotes 
promotes roots, seeds, stems, and leaves. These are likely to be uh, offenders if you are sensitive. So your spinach and kale smoothie and your stir fry and your salad and perhaps your handful of this nuts or that nuts, um, these could be causing problems. And that's why we want to make sure uh, that we can tolerate certain foods and we can thrive with certain foods and nothing uh, escapes scrutiny. And that's a very important point I'd like to make because I've spent so much time and energy uh, communicating the boilerplate idea uh, that the beautiful, colorful produce of the planet uh, should be, is the recommended dietary centerpiece. We talked about in the Primal Blueprint and the older books that uh, the plant life should be the bulk of your diet, should take up the most room on the plate. And then, of course, the nutrient-dense, uh, sustainably raised animal foods would have the most caloric density and the most nutrition. Uh, but now, uh, Dr. Saladino has made an excellent case to the idea that these uh, beautiful green produce uh, foods uh, may not be necessary to consume and might even be harmful. But again, it's highly personalized and individualized, so you want to test and retest and evaluate for yourself. Uh, but this idea was enough for me to make a lifelong uh, what I believe to be a lifelong shift toward an animal-based diet, acknowledging and confirming that these are the most nutrient-dense foods on the planet by and large. And then when it comes to getting nutritious carbohydrates, I am favoring the least offensive, the ones that have the lowest levels of plant toxins, which would be things like fruit, honey, the root vegetables, sweet potatoes and squash, a uh, recent point made by Jay Feldman that you want to peel the skins off because those have the most uh, concentrated toxins, what little toxins there are in those root vegetables. So good stuff. I'm doing that. Uh, of course, don't forget avocados, cucumbers, and uh, things that we don't usually consider uh, to be fruits. Those are fruits, very easy to digest, very nutritious. Uh, I'm also putting, uh, personally in my category, dark chocolate because I seem to tolerate it well because I eat a ton of it. It tastes good. It's a great indulgence and it's a great snack. Uh, fermented foods would also be in this category because those uh, make digestion much easier. So all the uh, kefir, uh, kimchi, kombucha, miso, natto, olives, pickles, sauerkraut, tempeh, uh, high probiotic, nourishing healthy gut bacteria, and free from the concerns and objections with the uh, offensive plant food categories. And of course, I have uh, the macadamia nut butter on the list as well, uh, because again, I enjoy it. I tolerate it. It's a very uh, nutrient-dense snack, um, but that's in the uh, one of the categories that's potentially offensive, and we know that because so many people report nut allergies. Uh, so there's the quick overview of getting healthy first and emphasizing uh, nutritious foods and avoiding those problematic, heavily processed modern foods. And now it is time to go deep into uh, numerous reflections on the energy balance concept as I consulted with numerous experts, as well as uh, hearing from ordinary listeners of the show that made wonderful points. And so here's the question is, how do we dial in our eating and our exercise, of course, as well, if you are already healthy, active, athletic, have peak performance goals, and of course, might have a, a bit of body, compos body composition goals in there too, that you want to uh, finish off, you know, get the final, <laughs> the final touches done, lose that last five pounds or last 10 pounds. So as I propose many times, um, it, with the awakening coming from my interviews with Jay Feldman and my reflections afterward, do we need to engage in fasting, carbohydrate restriction, time-restricted eating, and other uh, restrictive strategies to obtain these vaunted health benefits? Or do we have redundant pathways where we get the same benefits that we get from fasting when we are burning up cellular energy during a workout? And the answer is unequivocally yes. So these redundant pathways exist and you engage in autophagy during a workout just as you do during an extended fast. Um, I'm going to bring up Mike Mutzel shortly, Metabolic Mike, a popular YouTuber and podcaster uh, with very scientifically rigorous shows and presentations with great experts and a lot of his own uh, teaching content. He just published a, a recent video on YouTube called Why I'm Not Fasting and Why I'm Doing This Instead, and he goes into this same uh, big picture of who needs to fast, who can stand to benefit most from fasting, and who might want to second-guess it. Uh, 
uh, excellent content. I want to direct you to uh, watch that video and reflect. But uh, generally or quickly, uh, those who stand to benefit the most from restrictive diets are those with the most metabolic damage. So the ketogenic diet on a morbidly obese hospital patient is going to work wonders, uh, just as is someone who's gone from uh, unrestricted, unregulated eating habits and is now uh, going into a 16-8 uh, fasting pattern or a two meals a day pattern uh, and so forth is going to report wonderful benefits. Um, but we're going uh, on this show, especially focusing on the active athletic person and whether these redundant pathways can possibly turn into an overly stressful experience. This was my slap in the face from the first interview I heard with Jay Feldman and Ben Greenfield when he said fasting turns on stress hormones, keto turns on stress hormones, low carb, restrictive dieting, time-restricted feeding, and this is indeed the mechanism by which they provide the benefits. Um, of course, this is obvious, this is undisputed, uh, but for me, I, didn't f I failed to appreciate the significance of that when I'm looking at all these other stress factors in my life. So we're thinking intense workout and we're thinking fasting on the same uh, category, the same scale, and then therefore uh, proceeding with caution if we're doing a lot of that. So um, with most of the benefits uh, uh, conferred to the metabolically damaged, inactive, and processed food eating population, what about those of us who are diligently uh, consuming healthy, nutritious foods? Okay, uh, Rob Wolf weighs in uh, very well on our interview where he said he's uh, no longer concerned at all uh, with the previously communicated dangers of consuming excess protein. And I think this really started when the keto diet took on popularity and it was learned that if you consume a lot of protein, remember you're cutting your carbs back to 50 grams a day to be keto, but if you load up on protein, um, you also uh, sort of inhibit the production of ketones in the liver, um, especially when, uh, in some cases, if you're really restricting carbs and consuming a lot of protein, you're going to trigger gluconeogenesis. That's the conversion of amino acids into glucose to provide for your energy needs. And so, um, therefore, if you have enough glucose via gluconeogenesis, uh, you're going to uh, not have the highest requirement for ketones. And so people were saying, hey, definitely cut your carbs and watch your protein, keep your protein low. And so then you're going into this high fat diet. Uh, it was ridiculed as the bacon and butter diet because there were thumbs up for any kind of fat and stuffing your face with fat all day long. And then you're in the keto club. And that was really disturbing to uh, myself and Mark Sisson, having put out one of the first and most comprehensive books. And now we're seeing uh, keto on all kinds of packaged processed junk food, essentially, but it didn't have the um, it didn't have the carbs, so you could put keto on it, or it had the uh, the net carbs taken down uh, through inclusion of other uh, questionable agents into the food. So um, now Rob is no longer concerned with the dangers of consuming excess protein, and so many other people are echoing this message uh, that our body can do pretty well. And whenever you may have heard about, boy, you're kidneys are going to get thrashed or your liver is going to be overloaded um, with excreting all this extra nitrogen, um, these concerns are probably tied to uh, studies on unfit population or other confounding variables that uh, reduce the uh, the, the significance of the message. Furthermore, protein has extremely high satiety factor. And so it's very difficult to uh, consume protein to excess to where you're getting yourself into a, a health challenge, right? Uh, everyone, uh, raise your hand and reference the number of times that you have eaten too many steaks or too many omelets or uh, too many eggs like Cool Hand Luke in the movie. Not really that relevant because uh, after you eat a significant high-protein meal, you're not going to be wandering around an hour later looking for more, <laughs> another cut of salmon after you had a, a wonderful dinner. Uh, in contrast, think of the uh, nutrient-deficient, hyper-palatable, modern 
modern processed foods, uh, the ice cream, the cheesecake, the potato chips, all the stuff that we nibble on and graze on and then go reach for more and then some more after that and then some more and pretty soon we've eaten the whole bag or the whole tub and that's because these things uh, don't provide that satiety that a truly nutrient-dense food does. You've heard me talk about the protein lever theory nicely communicated by Dr. Ted Naiman on our interview uh, where he contends and cites the research that we have this deep, intense biological drive to consume sufficient protein uh, on average uh, through day-to-day -day consumption, not exactly every single day, but we are highly calibrated to go and get enough protein from our food uh, to survive and to thrive. And so uh, the protein lever theory contends that our appetite is going to be directly tied to the amount of protein we consume. And if we consume a minimal protein, we are going to be driven and stimulated to consume more and more potato chips and ice cream and cheesecake. Uh, those are some examples that have very low protein uh, content. And we're going to keep eating those in a desperate and uh, futile attempt to get our protein needs met. So we're these uh, protein craving beasts every single day when we wake up. That's why I'm so excited about uh, releasing my new protein supplement, the B-Rad Grass-Fed Whey Protein Isolate Superfuel, because when you give yourself a couple scoops of protein every day, you're going to promote satiety, you're going to promote healthy and highly regulated eating habits, and you're also going to help yourself uh, recover and perform uh, magnificent athletic feats or moderate fitness feats, whatever you want to uh, plug in there, uh, especially for um, the advancing, as you advance through the age groups, you become uh, worse, less effective at assimilating protein from the diet. So you actually have elevated protein needs as you age. And we think of the uh, the young bucks in the gym slamming their protein shakes, and that's the target market. But really, the target market should be even the senior population who are going through life with uh, losing and slipping a little bit uh, with each passing decade, the ability to uh, uh, digest and assimilate protein and maintain that lean muscle mass, which is the number one most important marker for aging gracefully. So taking a supplement, you get the job done uh, much more easily, particularly at times when you might not have a ravenous appetite uh, for a four or five egg omelet. And um, it's, you know, these are like post-exercise time periods when your body temperature is elevated and other times when you're not super hungry to, to get your protein dialed in. So that's where a supplement can really come in and be a valuable part of your overall dietary strategy that's based, of course, in eating healthy, wholesome, nutritious foods. So I talked about Rob Wolf's uh, evolution of his thoughts and belief systems and recommendations, his epic quote that I repeat so often. Uh, he said, if you want to live longer, lift more weights and eat more protein. Dr. Tommy Wood, uh, with great content on our past interviews, uh, and one of his epic lines was how he counsels his healthy, active clients to, his, to eat as much nutritious food as possible until they perhaps gain a pound of fat, and then you can dial it back a little bit, but that's your signal that you are optimally fueled. And there are so many occasions of athletes and um, devoted fitness enthusiasts, the most, uh, the most uh, motivated and focused amongst us, uh, kind of slipping and screwing this up. I'm going to talk about the elite runner, Elise Cranny, uh, later in the content here. Uh, for a, a, a sobering story for all of us. It's, it's kind of uh, counter to this diet mindset that we've all been programmed with, uh, especially the female population uh, for, for our lifetime, right? We're watching our calories, we're watching our portion sizes. We don't want to be a slob. Uh, we feel embarrassed getting seconds or whatever the, the story that's playing in your mind. You don't want to uh, gain weight on your cruise. Uh, you don't want to gain weight uh, during the fall. You don't want to gain weight during the spring. And there's a constant regulator there. But if we're talking about nutritious foods, if we're talking about our protein requirements as we age, you have to make a devoted effort to honor the, the brilliant advice from Dr. Tommy Wood to eat as much nutritious food as you possibly can each day. And of course, I'm going to say in tandem with being as active as you possibly can. And so this is all predicated on a big picture view rather than 
um, the talking to the person who's uh, taking the subway, sitting in a cubicle all day, uh, sitting on the couch in the evening, and not moving sufficiently in daily life, that person is likely not going to have a ravenous appetite for extra calories. Uh, but what we want to do is turn on these appetite sensors and these energy, uh, energy production uh, aspects of the body so that we can lead a healthy, maximally active, maximally nutritious life. Um, I talked about Mike Mutzel's YouTube, uh, Ryan Baxter, my recent uh, guest on the show, uh, with a very diligent and carefully measured experiment lasting for one year. He ate 600 additional nutritious calories each day. So this wasn't the uh, Slurpee experiment or the, the donut bash. It was him increasing intake of nutritious foods. He did it for a year straight and weighed the same a year later with the same or very similar body composition. I think he might have improved his body composition slightly, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but anyway, what a profound example for all of us to uh, reference, since I'm certainly not about to uh, measure my caloric intake for an entire year every single day. So good on you. I love the, uh, the scientifically minded uh, among us out there. And I'm just going to take this insight and uh, really reflect on that. So if he is consuming 600 additional nutritious calories each day and not gaining any weight, what's going on? And I don't think he had a massive shift in his exercise, his caloric output either. That was the whole point here was that um, he's, he's doing everything the same and just throwing down some extra nutritious food. And I keep saying nutritious as a qualifier because if you eat 600 calories uh, of additional junk food every day, uh, you're going to add a lot of weight at the end of a year of that experiment. So what's going on? What he's doing is becoming more metabolically active and turning up all those important dials uh, in his in his uh, overall human functioning. Uh, remember the quote from Dr. Ponser, reproduction, repair, growth, and locomotion are a zero-sum game. Uh, borrow a lot from one, you're going to have to turn down the others. And if you are uh, borrowing or toning down uh, one of those four dials via uh, restricted caloric intake or, or suppressed caloric intake, you're going to turn down your reproductive fitness a bit. You're going to turn down your ability to recover, to repair, to grow. And of course, your locomotion is going to suffer if you're not getting sufficient calories. Um, Dr. Stacy Sims at Stanford, uh, expert on hydration with particular interest and particular expertise in uh, the female population and how they respond to exercise, nutrition, diet, and hydration. Uh, she makes an important point on a recent podcast with Gabby Reese, who uh, launched her podcast fairly recently I urge you to go over there and listen to it. She's one of my favorite guests I've ever had. Um, she did such a great job promoting her appearance on the B-Rad podcast that we experienced a huge spike in listenership after her show because she uh, pumped it out to her uh, large social media following. So uh, a great woman. Um, her book, what was the title? Uh, I'm, my Foot is Too Big for the Glass Slipper. Um, I enjoyed it so much. I think it's more directed to uh, the female reader, but uh, she is just so thoughtful, so profound with um, her reflections on life and relationships and happiness and athletics and fitness. Uh, but anyway, she was interviewing Dr. Stacy Sims, and Dr. Sims said, look, females respond differently to fasting carb restriction, calorie restriction, time-restricted feeding than males because females are wired for reproductive fitness. That is their primary biological drive. And when you start to mess with caloric intake or limit a certain macro like carbohydrates in the name of keto, the female is very likely to have an adverse response, especially an active athletic female. So you think about uh, the, the CrossFit enthusiast or the long distance runner who is preparing for a competitive event, also walking around with female biology, which is uh, genetically programmed for reproductive fitness, and reproductive fitness is strongly associated with carrying sufficient amounts of body fat, right? And then you're devotedly 
trying to counter your genetics by going into uh, the CrossFit workouts and the restrictive dieting, trying to get the six pack, and you're going to screw up all kinds of things. And there's so many stories of uh, females experiencing um, difficulties with thyroid, with adrenal function, chronic fatigue, um, difficulty reducing excess body fat, even though they're restricting calories. Um, L. Russ's book, the paleo thyroid solution gets deep into this story of uh, you know over exercising, over stressing, under eating, and the disaster that happens. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I think Dr. Sims mentioned this a bit, where uh, in, especially in the short term, if a male embarks on fasting, time restricted feeding, carb restriction, in the short term you're going to get a boost in testosterone as part of the stress response because um, this might be uh, an oversimplification of ancestral health. Uh, but as I heard, uh, heard Gabby and Dr. Sims talking about it, you know, we're imagining like the male hunter-gatherer who has to go hunt and continue to hike and track and try to bring down some game to feed the clan. They have to perform uh, even in the absence of dietary calories. And that's, that's how uh, the, the uh, ketone production uh, got wired into our genetics. It was a key survival mechanism throughout evolution to allow us to continue to go hard and to fuel that incredibly ravenous brain wanting 20% of all our daily calories despite only weighing 2% of your total body weight, in my case, 2.5%. Uh, anyway, <laughs> uh, the, the, all these functions are stress mechanisms and the male's going to respond favorably in the short term. And of course, uh, especially if that male, modern male has some extra body fat or some extra visceral fat and engages in fasting, keto, time restricted feeding, and gets some of that excess fat off the body, uh, that is going to have a highly beneficial effect on male hormones. Meanwhile, the female, and we get a lot of this uh, from our, our live retreats or from emails where uh, the couple decides to go keto, uh, to go low carb, uh, to go into the fasting patterns, and the male reports great results and the female's frustrated, tired, exhausted. And um, so we just have to honor our uh, biological drives and our genetic programming and to realize that especially the healthy, active, athletic female is at high risk of not succeeding with restrictive diets. Um, a quick note here, uh, uh, inspired by my podcast with Lindsay Barra, the host of the Food of the Gods podcast, tagline, How Elite Athletes Eat and Train for Peak Performance, uh, she reports, Almost no incidences of restrictive dieting amongst the elite athlete population across an incredible variety of sports. She's interviewed PGA Tour golfers. She's interviewed race drivers, Olympic athletes, uh, the Olympic uh, heptathlete Sherry Hawkins. Uh, she's interviewed uh, Gwen Jorgensen, the Olympic gold medal uh, female triathlete. And so all these athletes have something in common, which is they eat a lot of food, they eat sufficiently, uh, they're not restricting any certain macronutrients, uh, despite what you may have seen on uh, propaganda documentaries about this vegan population of high performers. Um, that's pretty suspect. Uh, there are few and far between, if there are any, and those genetic freaks that are performing at the top level, uh, whether they're MMA fighters or Olympic players or, or team sport uh, superstars, they have a lot going for them. And if they happen to be thriving, it might be in spite of a restrictive diet, especially when it comes to a plant-based diet that's uh, restricting many of the most nutritious foods on earth. So I'm going to point to the elite athlete population in general and notice that there are almost no occasions of them uh, engaging in restricted eating. And there are many occasions of them slamming all kinds of supplements, supplemental calories. And of course, I'm going to also point my finger and say, boy, overall, uh, quite a few elite athletes have a long way to go with cleaning up their diet because we know that they still are indulging in all kinds of junk food. They're real people. They might not be, you know, highly focused and refined on their dietary choices. And so I think in the coming years, especially as the importance and the money in sports continue to escalate, we're going to see better and better and cleaner and cleaner eating habits amongst the elite. 
but I am not holding my breath to see the day that a ketogenic athlete is out there uh, winning uh, Olympic medals. That could be a long time coming, except in the extreme endurance events where it might confer a performance advantage. Zach Bitter talks about this a lot on his Human Performance Outliers podcast, where if you can become extremely fat adapted and not need to take many calories on board, if you're going for a really, really long time, um, that could be a good deal because it is tough to continue to fuel as you perform for 10 hours, 12 hours, 24 hours, that kind of thing. Um, but that's an isolated example. And let's take that, that, that takeaway is that the elite athletes are by and large fueling themselves. I hope they'll clean up their diet in the years ahead. I was watching a cool Adidas promo video where the two great Olympic sprinters, Wade Van Niekerk from South Africa, the world record holder in the 400 meters with his amazing performance in Rio, uh, setting the gold and breaking the world record from the outside lane in 43.03, one of the greatest performances of all time by a human in any sport. And then Noah Lyles, the recent world champion in the 200 meters, uh, were out there training and uh, driving somewhere during the, the filming and they stopped at a donut shop to slam some donuts and I was like heartbroken to see like hey we're trying to get an inside look at how these guys live their life and how they train and here they are slamming some donuts not a good look for all those young runners out there but then as I reflect further I'm going okay um, so in this week where they slam the donut, I, I'm going to bet it was a special occasion. And then I'm also going to look at um, how many reps they did in the gym, throwing those heavy weights around, running the, the, the breakdown of uh, two 400s, four 300s, eight 200s, some sprints, some jumps, some stretch cord work. And these guys are training all day long at the highest, highest level. And so that donut is going into a very, very hot furnace. And it's certainly uh, not one of the um, major factors or concerns uh, that's inhibiting them from uh, getting the gold and breaking world records. Not so for that uh, recreational enthusiast who goes and uh, does a, a spin class, stops and grabs a donut, and then sits in an office for hours afterward. So uh, put that all in proper context. And so I'm talking through uh, numerous people that have weighed in or that I've uh, solicited information from. Uh, Rob Wolf, Tommy Wood, Mike Mutzel, Ryan Baxter, Dr. Stacy Sims with Gabby Reese. Uh, and then the young listener, Dan Patterson, who I was inspired to do an entire show uh, about his concept of eating more and moving more as the path to longevity and health span, and thereby uh, developing a faster metabolism to promote greater health and longevity. It was a really interesting twist on uh, a lot of the commentary that we hear, whereby if you um, restrict your calories, you're going to live a longer life. And so a slower metabolism is going to uh, work out for you better than a faster one because a faster metabolism is uh, accelerated cell division, which is a high cancer risk. And then of course, we only have uh, telomeres that are so long. And the more your cell divides, it divides, it divides, it divides only a certain number of times. And then essentially the cell dies and the organism dies. And so we want to stretch that out as to how the talk goes. Uh, but this is a very interesting counterpoint where um, because we uh, move so minimally today, um, we will be well served to get up and move around more, burn more calories, consume more nutritious food, and thereby uh, keeping that muscle mass and keeping that cardiovascular fitness and keeping that organ function going uh, for a very long, healthy, happy, active, enjoyable life. And forget about uh, who's going to break the record someday. Like Ben Greenfield said, I don't want to live to be 170 years old if I'm walking around hunched over and, um, you know, I, I don't have any libido, I don't have any energy, but I'm just uh, drifting along through life because uh, his calories are restricted or he's engaging in whatever magic formula there is. But it is an interesting uh, kind of reflection, like who is the optimal? Uh, long distance longevity superstar? Is it going to be that yogi who engages in prolonged fasts and sits on a rock and meditates for two hours every day and two hours again in the afternoon? Or is it going to be uh, those athletic types that you see uh, the 75 year olds running in the track meets and uh, carrying around big muscles and uh, parading around the gym with their gray hair and 
their six pack? I, I don't know the answer to that, uh, but I also want to put in a plug for enjoying your life and being active and physical rather than just being highly capable of uh, eating your lentil soup with brown rice and then sitting on a rock and then walking back and uh, reading and, and going to bed on time. Um, if that's what turns you on, that's great. Uh, but I'm out there uh, with the, uh, the, the like-minded uh, pursuing peak performance with passion throughout life. And so I would even trade, you know, uh, going from uh, 110 to 120, I would, I, would, uh, I would turn those 10 years in uh, for better performances over the next several decades in my 50s, 60s, and 70s. You know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm saying? Okay. Okay, so we have Rob Wolf's wonderful quote. If you want to live longer, lift more weights and eat more protein. And I might uh, take the liberty of adding to that, uh, knowing that Rob would nod his head in agreement. Um, so we're going to lift more weights. We're going to eat more protein. We're also going to move more in general terms throughout the day and throw that in there along with the obligation of lifting weights. And we're going to also, besides eating more protein, we're going to eat a necessary amount of nutritious carbs and uh, healthy, nutritious, natural fats. Okay, so there is a bit longer of an admonition to lift more weights, eat more protein, move more, and also get those other wonderful nutritious foods into your system. Oh, okay, wait, back up a little bit. Wait a second, Brad. What about Dr. Ponser's constrained model of energy expenditure, where it's asserted that we have a daily caloric expenditure ceiling uh, regardless of what level we exercise at? Well, Ryan Baxter weighs in here. <laughs> he who ate 600 calories per day extra for a year to directly refute this constrained model theory, um, he alerted me to recent research uh, suggesting, proposing that the constrained model of energy expenditure is only applicable when the human is in an energy deficit. And so this research is uh, largely uh, inspired uh, or performed on the Hadza, the one of the last remaining hunter-gatherer populations in the world located in Tanzania. Uh, they're very active, right, by necessity. They're moving around all day. The males walk an average of seven miles a day, the females three miles a day, uh, gathering and, and hunting and, and doing their thing. Um, and so they do not have enough food in general. They're basically hanging on by a thread. And so, of course, that type of human experience uh, is going to kick in an assortment of compensatory mechanisms to turn down those flames so that they can survive on whatever food that they get. Um, so if the constrained model is only applicable in energy deficit, uh, that doesn't apply to most of the world because we have an energy surplus. We have plenty of food, and if we are able to uh, access more nutritious foods, and when I say food, <laughs> let's qualify that there because the processed shit that a lot of us put down our throat uh, to comprise a vast majority of the calories in the standard American diet, remember that research widely touted uh, from Dr. Lauren Cordain, one of the forefathers of paleo, author of the Paleo Diet book, uh, he contends that 71% of the daily caloric intake uh, in the standard American diet comes from foods that were entirely absent in the evolutionary experience. They process oils, uh, sugars, and grains. So nutrient deficient processed foods uh, notwithstanding here. Um, if we have an energy surplus, if we have plenty of sufficient food, we are going to become more active and we are going to turn up those dials like reproduction, repair, growth, and locomotion. Um, I want to read a quote from the conclusion of the study. Energy balance status seems to play an important role in the relationship between physical activity and total energy expenditure. When in a positive energy balance, the relationship between total energy expenditure and physical activity was consistent with an additive model. However, when energy balance was negative, total energy expenditure seems to be consistent with a constrained model. Uh, so consistent with an additive model means that your physical activity 
uh, is X, right? You're running 30 miles a week instead of sitting on your butt. And that means you're going to expend more total energy. You're going to burn more calories, just like we've always thought. The additive model has always been assumed, especially in the exercise, fitness, and diet community where you go online, you see your handy little calculator, or you go to the gym and you're working on an exercise machine and it says, congratulations, you burned 478 calories. And then the user uh, walks out with a smile on their face thinking that uh, they just lost um, one fifth of a pound, right? We're, we're thinking in this uh, calories in, calories out model, but there's so many variables. And that's what uh, a lot of the content of the Jay Feldman interviews were all about, where um, we're trying to turn up those dials and uh, burn more energy, manufacture energy more efficiently, and transcend uh, this supposed constrained model. Now, um, there are a lot of factors that are relevant where um, if you exercise too much, you're going to turn down those other dials reliably so and bring your caloric expenditure back down in the, uh, in the spirit of the constrained model. Uh, so back to the quote, I just wanted to explain the additive model versus the constrained model. Uh, so when energy balance was negative, total energy expenditure seems to be consistent with the constrained model. So think about the active athletic female doing CrossFit, trying to uh, reveal that six pack and cutting calories, cutting calories. They are going to constrain their energy expenditure and keep that fat on their body uh, due to the compensatory mechanisms of turning down thyroid, turning down overall energy levels, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so back to the quote, these findings support physical activity for weight gain prevention by increasing total energy expenditure. That's uh, validating um, the, the mainstream notion of going out there and exercising burning calories. However, the effect of physical activity on total energy expenditure during periods of weight loss may be limited. So right, uh, when you are successfully dropping excess body fat when you're in your mode and it's been going on for two months and you're weighing yourself and you're dropping a pound here and a pound there, um, you're in sort of a, um, a, a high stress um, situation, right? The body does not necessarily like to drop excess body fat. And so um, you are going to engage in assorted compensations as a protective mechanism against uh, wasting away and starving. That's why weight loss has to be very carefully contemplated with this under the radar strategy that I'll be talking about more in the months and years ahead. We're trying to zero in on the magic formula for successful weight loss, healthy way. And it appears to be uh, an under the radar strategy is what's going to be effective versus the uh, extreme or the crash approaches with excessive exercise or excessive calorie restriction, that's when we're going to kick into the constrained model of energy expenditure. Uh, so this new research and this conclusion that when, when in positive energy balance, when you have enough calories, the relationship between your energy expenditure and your physical activity is additive, uh, is really intriguing to me because I've uh, been struggling and uh, disturbed by the notion that we operate under this constrained model because there's so much anecdotal evidence that the more you exercise, uh, the more calories you burn, uh, the leaner you're going to get. We have the, the Tour de France cyclists proving this every year, the triathletes um, who are very lean and eat a ton of calories. Um, and so that seems to transcend the constrained model. Uh, my second show with Dr. Ponzer was sort of in a uh, devil's advocate mode where I was saying, what about this? What about that? And he had some, uh, some, some good reflections to offer, but I think we, um, we can operate under the assumption that if you're fueling yourself well and uh, increasing your energy expenditure, this is going to be a positive for things like reducing excess body fat. Now, uh, we are going to drift into another segment, which I'm going to save for uh, a third show in a loosely tied together series. So uh, the first one and this one here are uh, lightly associated. We're still reflecting on this energy balance model and where the uh, caloric intake fits in with the caloric expenditure appropriately. And the next one's gonna get a little controversial where we uh, kind of take a departure from the foundational elements of ancestral health and a lot of the content in books like The Keto Reset Diet and Two Meals a Day. Uh, but I think you're gonna find um, some comfort at the end of this series when we uh, put it all together 
and realize that we can um, we can win at this game uh, where we don't have to struggle and suffer in the name of fat reduction or health or fitness or vitality. So let me end it there. Thank you for listening and uh, stay tuned for more to come on these important topics. Thank you for listening to the show. I love sharing the experience with you and greatly appreciate your support. Please email podcast at bradventures.com with feedback, suggestions, and questions for the Q&A shows. Subscribe to our email list at bradkearns.com for a weekly blast about the published episodes and a wonderful bi-monthly newsletter edition with informative articles and practical tips for all aspects of healthy living. You can also download several awesome free ebooks when you subscribe to the email list. And if you could go to the trouble to leave a five or five star review with Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to the shows, that would be super incredibly awesome. It helps raise the profile of the BRAD podcast and attract new listeners. And did you know that you can share a show with a friend or loved one by just hitting a few buttons in your player and firing off a text message? My awesome podcast player called Overcast allows you to actually record a soundbite excerpt from the episode you're listening to and fire it off with a quick text message. Thank you so much for spreading the word. And remember, be rad.